as I go along, if you if you get uh, stuck or anything, just raise your hands and the the students' assistants will come around helping you. And uh, if all three of them are busy helping someone, then I'll uh, pause the uh, I'll just uh, put on the brakes a bit and wait until we've gotten everyone on track. Right. So now we've gotten the projector up and running. So we'll start off by creating a new project. Now this uh, computer up here is the only one that hasn't got the 2017 one. You can see it's still the 2015. So I'm going to go and uh, make the day a bit worse for some of the IT guys afterwards, just so that they fix it either today or tomorrow. So we do projects up here, click it, and we get the projects uh, window open here. We choose a new project and we just use a new single user project. This Vault option, uh, which is here, that is if you have the Autodesk Vault uh, database uh, program uh, software uh, running. So that, that means that you uh, sort of have a, a, a separate server where everything is being stored as you go along and you have to, if you're going to do work on an already existing file, you have to check it out so that anyone else doing work inside the database will see that, well, you are working on this file now, so I can do anything to that file. So you sort of uh, reserve the files and stuff. So that's usually how uh, companies work, but we don't have that system here, so we are going to use the single user project. And we did next, so we can choose a project name. I'll just call it practice task one. And then you need to choose a folder. So I would recommend that you go to go to your uh, the my computer part, and then you find the H drive, which is your server drive here for on your student number. And it means that you you will be able to access it. So if you you don't have to sit at the exact same computer every time you're here, so you can sit at whatever computer you are, you are, is available. So I've already created uh, everything as I created the compendium. So I think I'll start a new, uh, <clears throat> a completely new folder. I'll just call it lecture, just for my part. You don't need to do this. And then I'll do practice task one folder. And as you can see, even though I've created the practice task one folder here, it still says new folder here. It says it in Norwegian for, for me here, but it's new folder here. So you actually have to click on a different folder first and then back to practice task one, because now it says practice task one. And then you can do okay. For some reason, it, it really doesn't manage to do the first, do the first, uh, first folder. As you create it, it uh, the program just doesn't recognize the folder until you've uh, chosen another one first. And then we do the finish button. Then we created the practice task one project. So now we need to start a new uh, new file. So I push the new button up in the corner there, or control N if uh, people like to use shortcuts. If you need help, don't be shy. Just really stretch your hands up because it's difficult to see see who needs help um, between all of the screens here. So it's a bit easier if you lift your hands up high. <clears throat> As you can see here, we have we have many different kinds of templates to choose from. Usually, if you're working for a company, you will only have one template, and that is the template of the company that you're following. So it's a bit easier when you're working for a company. So, what we want, we do not want imperial units. We don't want to be working in, in inches and feet. We want to be working in millimeters. So we want a metric one. So we choose that one. And then we see we are going to start off with a standard part. So we will choose standard part with millimeter in the parentheses there. And dot IPT behind, which is inventor part file uh, is the abbreviation for it. So it means that we are creating a single part in this one. We click create down here. And 
then it creates the new Just do a little pause so we can get everyone on the same page here. Ja, nei, men vi tar en pause nå til alle, alle på plass. Looking for uh, tomorrow. 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 Yeah. yeah. So I was looking okay. to see uh, yeah. the days uh, area. Yeah. It was a big lecture. No, it's a good one. No. Anyone? It was a bit of a big photon font. And you're on this. Okay. No, make a scene then. Men jag såg det så ganska skolan igår. Jag tror han kom sent. Ja. Men det är att han är borta väldigt mycket nu. Och han sitter med tre kontexamen här och sådant. Ja. Så det är lite. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. 
Right, so I think uh, everyone is on the same page more or less, either that or uh, they are advanced way past it. That's completely okay. If, you, uh, if you've done practice task one and maybe even two and started on three, just continue on where you are. It just means that you really don't need to follow what I'm doing here because you already know how to do it. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, completely okay. <coughs> so we've, uh, we've created a new part here. And uh, we are going to create a sketch in order so that we can start drawing uh, the part that we are going to draw. So in order to start a sketch, we have this symbol up top here. It says 2D sketch. And the nice part of the thing about Inventor is that if you just let your mouse pointer rest on top of uh, a button, it usually pops up one of these tooltips where you get a lot of information about what exactly is it this button does. So in many of them, there are even animations here that shows, uh, shows with movement what, what's going to happen. So we start a new 2D sketch. And then we get up this image where we have four, uh, three different planes. So we have a plane on the, on the Z and Y axis, which is going up here and across. We have a plane on the X and Y axis, which is going up here and across there. And then we have a plane on the x and z axis, which is the horizontal one here. One thing that is nice to do when you're choosing a plane to put your sketch on is just keep a small eye on this cube up here, which says front, right, top, and everything. Because it's a bit easier than to orient your sketch where you're putting it. So that in this case, we are just going to make a flat plate. So I would like it to be placed on the horizontal one, so that I will, uh, will make it sort of lie horizontal, so the top will be, will, be, will be the part that we see. So I just like if you place it directly on a table. By the way, I also have it, I also have it 3D printed here, the one we are going to create. So by, by choosing the, the XZ uh, plane here, we are basically just placing it like this on it, so it will be like placing it flat on a table. <clears throat> so now I'm going to, to choose it. So you see it lights up uh, when I hover over it. The others will light up if I choose one of them. But now I'm doing the XZ plane. So there. And now we see it says top on that one. It's tilted it a bit and it does that sometimes. I don't know what exactly, uh, uh, how exactly Inventor determines when it's going to tilt at 90 degrees or not. but. It's not really a big problem. Uh, the main part here is that we have the top uh, up. So now we're going to start drawing. So we're going to create a single line. We have the, the line function up here. Hold over it and it shows you how to create a line even. And we are just going to place it. I'm going to place the starting point somewhere over here. And I'm going to place the ending point somewhere over here. And then I'm going, after I've placed the line, I'm going to tell it how it's going to be, how it's going to look like. So I'm placing the starting point, and I'm placing the end point. And now you see, it wants me to continue with another line, because sometimes that's what you want to do. You want to just continue making new lines uh, as you go along. Maybe you're making a contour of uh, an entire entire parts, but that's not what we're going to do now. So you can either do uh, a right click with your mouse button and choose OK, or you can just press your escape button on the keyboard. So then it will 
exit the line function, and then you have your one line going across here. <clears throat> we will now make this line into a construction line. So I'm going to mark it. So you see, it turned from it turned from a green to blue. And I'm going to choose this one up here, which says construction. And when I flip this switch, I'm going to remove the marking of it. You see, it's turned from a green line to a yellow line. Because this is just a line to help us play stuff. It's not a part, uh, it's, it's not a part of what we are going to design. It is just uh, to help us uh, place everything. So we are going uh, to constrain it to be horizontal. So now I need to go into the constraint part up here. And then we see this one says horizontal constraint. Sometimes it can be a bit tricked here because as has happened now when we looked at the, at the top one here, it has flipped it 90 degrees. So it might be that we have to use the use the horizontal instead of, uh, no, use the vertical instead of the horizontal. But it's going to tell us when we start using it. So I'm going to press the horizontal one now. And I'm going to hold it over the line. Ah, now we see it's creating a vertical line. That's, this is because it's twisted 90 degrees. So then I'm just going to choose the vertical instead. So when I hold it over there, we get it horizontal according to our screen, but it's actually vertical according to the uh, X, Y, Z axis. When I choose it, it is automatically constrained to be, uh, be horizontal on a screen. So now I can mark it and I can move it around, but I can't really, I can't make it uh, change from being a horizontal line on my screen. Yeah, do the horizontal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was a bit too far. So we made it into a construction line, so that it's a dotted yellow line. And then we choose the horizontal constraint, as I did last time. But we'll see that it wants to make it horizontal this way because it thinks that this way is up. So to the to our axis system here, this is horizontal. But to our screen, it isn't horizontal. So we're going to choose the one that says vertical instead, beside there. So vertical constraint. And that's going to look, look horizontal on our screen. So now when I press the line, it becomes horizontal on my screen here. And if I grab one of the edges of the line now, I can, I can uh, alter the, the length of the line, but I can't make it anything else than being horizontal. I can move it up and down, and I can change the length, but I can't make it uh, into an angle. If I go a couple of steps back here before I made it horizontal, if I grab the same same corner here, I can change the angle of the line without a problem. So now it is completely completely horizontal on our screen. We can't, we can't make it move into another angle at all. And now we are going to do another constraint. So again, up to this constraint part up here. We have the different constraints here. We're going to choose the one that says coincident. And coincident means that we are placing two points on top of each other, or one point on top of a line. So coincident constraint. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to move along my, my horizontal line. And there we see I have found the middle point. I'm going to choose the middle point of the horizontal line. And now I'm going to choose the center point of my axis system, which is in the center of my screen. So now I've placed 
placed my constructor line in the center of the screen. And now the only thing I can change is the length of the line if I pull it. I can't make it move up and down anymore. Now it's only the length of the line that's being moved. <clears throat> so the next thing that we're going to do, ba basically what we've done now is to make the line that goes across the center of the, uh, of the uh, plate that we're going to create. And now we're going to make the outline that is below the center here. We're going to make this outline here. And we're going to use the line functions. And we're going to do the same as last. We're just going to place the lines fairly loosely, just approximately the correct shape. So I'm going to start with the line function up there. And I'm going to place it a bit away from the edge of the center line there. We are supposed to go at an angle down at first. Because the first thing we need to do is to create this angle down here. So I'm placing this one. And now, like last time, it wants to create the next line directly. So we are going to do that. And now we are going to create the bottom of this one. So we're going to let it go over here. But I'm not going to make it completely uh, horizontal because if you see, if I place it completely horizontal here, it is making this, this constraint symbol the same as is up top there. Which means that it is automatically putting on uh, this constraint for you, that it is going to be horizontal on your screen. But we want to do it now for just for practice. We want to do it uh, manually. So I'm going to move it a bit up so that it's at an angle instead of being uh, completely straight. <clears throat> so now we've gone, we've gone from this point. We've gone down here. And we've moved over here. And for now, we're going to disregard the curved edges. We're just going to make sharp angles instead. So now we're going to move up a bit. And here also we have the problem that if we put it, that was a bit, uh, yeah. if I put it up here, it says 90 degrees there and I'm getting a symbol that is sort of hidden here, but it's the same symbol as here, which means that it is constraining it to be normal to this line. So it's constraining this line to be normal to this one line and it's doing it automatically again, but I don't want it to do this automatically. So I'm going to move it away so that it doesn't do it. I want to do it manually afterwards, just to get the practice in. So now we've gotten all the way from this point, down here, over there, and now we've gotten up here. We just need the last bit at the end here. So one more line, trying to avoid it being uh, automatically constrained in any way here. Placing it there, and now I'm doing the last one that's going to go up here. Again, I'm trying to avoid the automatic constraints. And now I'm done, done placing my lines. I've gotten, I've gotten all the way from here, all the way through here, and I've gotten up to the center here. So now I'm going to push my escape button. Then I'm exiting the line function. And now what we'll do is we'll, we'll start off by making, making uh, the starting point where we started off creating the new lines. We'll make this one be attached to the end of the very first line that we created, the construction line. So again, we're going to use the coincident constraint. And that is the one up here. Coincident constraint. Choose this one. We move over to, to the starting point of our lines. We click on that one, and we move over to the end point of the construction line. We click on that one. And now you see it actually moved all of my, all of my lines a little bit, because it had to make those points fit together. And 
this line is stuck because it's connected to the center of our axis. So this line couldn't move, so then instead it had to move all of these other lines in order to get there. So? I might be doing uh, stuff slightly differently than what it says in the compendium, but basically what I'm doing is just I'm switching around on some of the uh, some of the points here. So what I'm going to do next is to do the other end of our lines, and I'm going to connect it to to this end. So I'm going to again I am still I'm still on the coincident constraint because if I remove my mouse pointer from there, we can see that it is, it is blue. So it is still in uh, in effect. We can also see the, the symbol here beside our mouse pointer that it is actually about to do a function. So I choose the endpoint here, and then the endpoint on the construction line there. And now you see it started to deform the basic uh, shape that we had. But that was only in order to get these lines to to actually hit each other at the ends there. To, to, to connect these ends, it had to alter the angles of these lines in order to, uh, to be able to do that. But that's not a problem. We're going to fix that as we go along now. So I pushed my escape button. So now the coincident constraint up there is no longer blue. And I don't have a symbol by my mouse pointer. So now I'm ready to start doing something else. And I think we'll, in fact, start off at this end, so I'm sort of moving backwards according to the compendium right now. Should I be? I think I'll, I'll start off at this end and just try to follow the compendium as much as I can. I'm doing this mostly by memory, so it's <laughs> so I'm sort of. Uh, so I'll do the use the dimension here, which is also a constraint, as you can see. It's it's placed inside the, the constraint part of the, of the toolbar. And it means that I'm going to tell the length of something. And when I tell it to be that length, it's going to be that exact length. So that it won't change afterwards. So I have, I've chosen the dimension function here. And I'm going to choose this end. Oh, is that what I'm actually doing here? Let's see. I'm going to to set the first dimension here. We're going to to set the length from this point and to to this point. But we're setting the length along here. So we need to choose this point first. So firstly we have this point. And then I'm moving my mouse pointer down to the other point here. And I can see that well now it did say point, but if I move my mouse pointer here, it gets white first, and then you get this point uh, up. A possibility that you can do here is actually use the drop-down menu, because if you have difficulty hitting exactly what it is you're supposed to hit, you can use the drop-down menu, and then you can see here, as I move it to, to curve, then this one turns white, so that would choose that one, and if I choose the other curve, then it's this one. But we're interested in the point right now. So we're going to the point up top, choosing that one. And now you can see it's exactly how this dimension is placed now. It's completely dependent on where my mouse pointer is located. So if I have my mouse pointer located uh, below or above the points, then it's going to be a horizontal dimension. But if I have my mouse point located on this side, or on that side, as you will see now, it's going to be a vertical dimension instead. Or if I put it over on this side, 
it is still a vertical dimension. And if I put my mouse pointer very close to the line here, it's going to be the length along the line. Th oh, it didn't want to do that on this one. It's not always that the inventor wants to do exactly what you try to do. But, but what we are after right now, we are after this length. So we are after the horizontal length between these two points. So I'm going to set this one here. And as you can see, I've been drawing it fairly small compared to what it's supposed to be. Because it's supposed to be 70 millimeters, not eight and a half. So now I have to push in here, 70 millimeters. And then you can either push the enter button on your keyboard or you can press the uh, little green check mark beside it and it will set the line. And now you see, everything disappeared from my screen. What you can do then, if everything disappears like this, it just means that we had, we had lines that were about 8 millimeters long, but we told them to be 70 millimeters. So they've just been blown up to a much larger scale. So what we can do then is to use this toolbar on the side here. And this symbol here, it will zoom to the extents of what you're drawing so that it will make sure that everything that you have drawn is inside your screen so that you can view everything. So I'm going to put my mouse pointer on this one and then zoom all, it says. So when I push the button, it zooms so that I get everything inside my view. So, we'll continue on with the horizontal lengths here to begin with, just to, to get everything set here. So the next one is supposed to be from this point, and to that point. And if we look at the, the drawing, it says 130 millimeters. Because it says 130 millimeters to, to this line that is going to go, go uh, vertical here. So we're going to set from the starting point there and to the end point there. That is one way of doing it. Another way of doing this one would be to choose the line itself. So I'm going to do, do that instead now. So go back to dimension here just to show. So if I put my mouse pointer onto the line itself, so that it turns white, then I press it, then I will get the length of that specific line. So I put this one in, and that wasn't so bad because when it scaled up this one from eight and a half millimeters to 70, it also scaled the rest of the lines. And this one ended up at 127 almost. So that's almost what it was supposed to be, so 130 put that one in. And you can see it, it sort of moved a little bit, but that was just a few millimeters. Just to get everything inside here, I'm going to use the zoom all button once more, just to get everything into, into place. <clears throat> then we're going to do the next horizontal length over here and after that we're going to have a break so we're going to do this point and over to this point and as you can see if I let my mouse pointer be inside this area inventor really doesn't know well what dimension am I supposed to put up here so I really do have to move it below them to get the horizontal dimension And this one is supposed to be 60 millimeters. Again, I'll use the zoom all because right now we can't see we can't see the points out here. They're off outside our view. So we'll use the zoom all just to see everything. So 
then we'll do a, a 15 minute break. Okay, so before I continue, I just want to make you all, all aware of that. On front of, in the mechanical design room, you have a submissions folder on, over on the side here. And the first, the first submission, now it didn't show the one that's supposed to show, it's here. And you can see here you have the, the uh, submission folder for the first mandatory meeting in, uh, where you're going to put your brainstorming sheet, the one you bring to the meeting uh, with me and Tobion. You're going to submit that in there and you also have gotten your submission one out for, for, the, uh, for this technical drawing. That's the individual submission. So you go into it and then you find the PDF there. So it's one part that you're going to make a 3D model of and then make a drawing of it. So and uh, basically when you've done part uh, practice task one and two, if you've done those, you know everything you need to know to do do this first submission. So that should be should be fair game uh, for everyone. It's uh, open until uh, the 23rd at noon, and that's Friday in two weeks. So you have today and you have next week and you have the week after that uh, to work on. Yes, the, the, the submission is it's open until the 23rd. So uh, that's Friday in two weeks and then at 12 o'clock. So when, when uh, Group B is done with their Friday session with both the lecture and their CAD study time, then uh, in two weeks from now, then it has to be uh, delivered. And that goes for both Group A and Group B. <coughs> So everyone gets uh, two weeks from uh, two weeks and one day, so 15 days from today. It was uh, available from Monday uh, at eight o'clock, the Monday earlier this week, and that's what's going to happen to all of the other, uh, the, the two other submissions also. They'll be available on the Monday, and then I'll announce them on uh, Thursday and Friday in the lectures, so that you will get basically two and a half weeks uh, if you if you just keep an eye on that submissions folder. So it will it will pop up every now and then. So check the check the CAD schedule when you are supposed to uh, to have uh, have them released, and then you can just go to the submission folder and get them. So you can actually start working on them before before we have the the lecture where I announce them. So it's just to give everyone as much time as possible to work on it. Right. So then we're back to. Uh, Back to our inventor. We're going to continue on with the practice task one. So now we're going to set uh, the the uh, vertical dimensions in our, on our screen. So we keep using the dimension tool. And one easy way of doing this now is just choosing the the symmetry line that we created, the construction line up there. We mark it, and you see now it wants to it wants us to set the horizontal length of it. But if we move our mouse pointer down to a point, it now wants to make the length between these. If I choose this point, so press on that point, and then it wants to create this vertical length between them. So I set this one. And if you look at the drawing on the first page of this task, it says uh, on the top of the uh, middle section, it says 90. But this is symmetrical around this line. So if it's 90 from the line and to the top, it will also be 90 from the line and to the bottom. So we can set this one to 90. So everything moved a bit. And then we have the next uh, uh, side over here, we need to put the length up there. So again, we just choose the, the entire symmetry line, just to make it a bit easier for ourselves. And we can choose this point. And now we try to set the dimension here, but if we look at the drawing, it says 60, but that's uh, uh, across the symmetry line, so we need half of it, because the 60 is divided in the middle by this symmetry line. So we need 30 there, and we get this one, and now it doesn't really look like our shape anymore. 
So we need to do something about these these different uh, lines, get them into uh, to the correct correct shapes. This one is correct now because it's been set at 70 this way and 90 this way. So this one is completely locked into place. But we need to do something about these other ones. So we're going to use the the uh, perpendicular constraint, as it's called. So we're going to set them to be at a 90 degree angle to each other. So we choose the perpendicular constraint up there. And now if I do this, the end line here first, I choose this one. And then I choose the, the symmetry line. So I'm going to tell it to have a 90 degree angle between those two. So then it snaps directly in and gets a 90 degree angle here. Then I can just continue on. So then, uh, yeah. then I continue to, to the next one. I choose the next line. And then I can choose the previous line here. Set it to be 90 degrees. So now we have 90 degrees here and we have 90 degrees here for both of these. Now, just to show that there are different ways of doing this, you don't need to put everything in 90 degrees. We can also tell lines to be, uh, to be uh, uh, parallel, yes. We can also tell lines to be parallel. So if I choose the parallel constraint up here, so now I can, for example, tell this line to be parallel with this line. So if I choose this line to be parallel with this line, then you will see it has to be, since this one is at a 90 degree angle here, this one also has to be at a 90 degree angle because it is now parallel with that one. And we can do the same for the last one. We can make it parallel with the symmetry line. So we do the parallel on this one and then parallel on the symmetry line. So now we have all of this. We can see all of our figure here, so I'm going to zoom out to, uh, to show everything here. Zoom to all. But now we have, we have sharp edges here. We're not supposed to have sharp edges. So we're going to use the fillet function, which is here in the, the create part of the toolbar. We have fillet up there. You can also see if we uh, we have a uh, drop-down menu here, so we can choose if we want if we want to make a rounded corner or if we want to make a chamfer, which is just a cut corner instead. Uh, beveled, I think the correct English term is. So we use the fillet one, and we were supposed to have twenty millimeter radius for this one. So the, the standard option is always two millimeters. If you haven't used fillet earlier in the day, uh, then it will always say two millimeters uh, from, from just the default that the inventor gives. So we're going to use 20 in this case. And now we're going to choose, we're go first going to create this one. So we're going to do it, we choose this line first. And then we're going to choose this line. And you'll see as I move the mouse pointer over now, it shows me where it's going to create, create the rounded edge. So when I choose this one, it's set here. And it says 20 there. If I just continue on now, I choose this line again. And then I can choose this line and it shows me that it does the the 20 millimeter radius on this one also. But for the last corner, it's not supposed to be 20 millimeters anymore. So we have to go back to, to the 2D fillet window. And we have to alter the dimension to 10 instead. And then we can choose these two lines. Uh, 
So as I hover over, we see that this rounded edge is now smaller than what these are. Zoom out a bit. So now I can exit the fillet function. So now we've created the entire lower parts of this plate from, from the symmetry line on this end and all the way around to the symmetry line on this end. So what we can do now is that we can do a mirror function. So we're going to let the, the symmetry line itself act as a mirror and we're going to basically let, uh, let Inventor copy everything that is below the symmetry line and then mirror it onto the top. So it saves us a lot of work. Instead of doing all of this work with dimensions and lines and everything that we have already done below the symmetry line, so instead of doing all of that on top of it, we can just use the mirror function and, and save time for it. So it's very, very, uh, very important if you want to be effective when you're working to, uh, to learn how to use these types of functions to save time. So they are located here in the toolbar, the, the pattern parts of the toolbar up there. So we have uh, the mirror one. We click on it to choose it. Now first off it says select and it says mirror line. And as long as you have one of these buttons and you have a red mouse pointer in it, it means that you have to select something. When you have selected something, the, that red mouse pointer will turn white. So that it won't let you apply anything until both of those mouse, pointer, mouse pointers are white. So we have to uh, do this for, uh, for both of those. And the first one, select, means that we have to select the lines that are going to be mirrored. So we choose the select function there. It needs to be blue for us to select. And now we have to choose all of the lines below the symmetry line. And one way of doing it is to create a, a, a marking box. So you just click and hold your mouse pointer while you drag it over here. And then you see all of the lines turn bright blue. So now it's all in one swoop. It's marked all of the lines instead of individually clicking each line. To mark them. And you see now the, the select button has turned into a white mouse pointer. So now it says, okay, you've selected some lines for me to mirror. It doesn't check if you've selected all of the lines that you intend to mirror because Inventor doesn't know what you intend to mirror yet. So it just says that you have, you've at least selected something. So it's up to you to make sure that all of the lines are now bright blue. And then we go over to the, the mirror line uh, part. We mark it so that the, the button becomes blue. And now we choose our symmetry line here. We mark it. And now the mirror line also became white. So now inventory is happy. Now it, can, it tells us we can apply this. It has everything it needs to know. So we press apply. And then everything is done. We can press done afterwards. We're not going to mirror anything else. If I zoom out here, we see that we have we have a perfect mirror on top of the symmetry line. So now the sketch itself is done. And when the sketch is done, we can go to finish sketch up on the edge there of the toolbar. We press it. And for some reason, mine chose to zoom in so that we can see it. So I'm going to do the zoom all again. So here we can see the sketch. It's been placed in the, in the uh, XZ plane that I chose, just the same as the top. And now we are going to use the extrude function in order to create this but basically extrude this 2D sketch and make it into a three-dimensional plate. So extrude. And so long as, as in this case, we have just one loop of lines in a sketch, Inventor will automatically choose that loop. 
If I had created two of these uh, plates in the same sketch, Inventor would have said, well, which one do you want? Then I would have had to choose one. And 10 millimeters is just like with the fillet radius, which is a default at two millimeters. 10 millimeters is a default on the extrude. If you haven't used extrude earlier this day, then it's going to say 10 millimeters. And in this case, I think we were supposed to have 10 millimeters. Yes, that was it. So we can just press enter. Then we've created our uh, plates. However, there is one thing we, or I, actually there are two things we need to look at uh, right now. One thing is we have over in the, in the part tree here, we have all of our parts. So if you choose extrusion one and uh, expand it, you can see the sketch. You also see that the sketch symbol is grayed out. It means that it has turned off the visibility, so you can see you can't see that sketch anymore. You only see the extruded part of it. But what we want to do now is we want to go back into our sketch. So we choose the sketch. We double click it. Uh, you have to double click the icon and not the name. If you double click the name, it just wants to rename it. And we're just going to check something before we continue. And what we're going to check is that in the corner here, it says fully constrained. All the way down here. Because if it says fully constrained here, then everything that you have drawn inside your sketch will be dark blue. Yeah. Uh, so if you see the blue now, yeah. Yeah. 
what's going to be the mirror lines and obviously it didn't manage to get this one but now we've had and then we can choose the mirror line and then go for this line now it manages to do it because it, it can't it can't really mirror run the mirror line because the mirror line is big enough that just becomes too much <laughs> Right, the, the reason that we are checking that this one is fully constrained is just to make sure that we don't have anything that's still undefined here, that everything has been given its correct dimensions. Because if I now, just to show you, if I choose this dimension down here, the 130 dimension, and I delete it, you see, suddenly a lot of my, uh, a lot of my uh, sketch ended up becoming green. And it also says that I need one dimension, because now it doesn't know that it's supposed to be 130 here. So one dimension needed there. So that, the problem then is that if later on you come back to this part and you're going to change something, you might end up with uh, sort of dragging it, making it longer than it was supposed to be, or maybe you'll end up dragging it to making it shorter or something. So you can also make it a lot shorter. So you can end up having these very serious mistakes happening just because one of your sketches wasn't fully constrained when you originally created this piece. So I'll just go back a couple of here. So then it's fully constrained again. I finished the sketch to go out of it. Now we have one more thing to do. It's supposed to be an aluminum plate, so we need to change the material of the plate. And we do that all the way at the top, where it says generic at the top there, because that's the default that uh, uh, Inventor does. It just creates a generic uh, material, so no special properties or anything. But if we do the drop down menu, you can see we have quite a lot to, uh, to choose from. And we are going to do aluminum. We see we want aluminum alloy 6061. So that's the one I've got marked there. We choose it, and now it actually changed color. Because the materials that are put in here, they are, uh, they try to mimic the, uh, the actual color of the material when they do it. So if I, just to uh, illustrate here, if I choose uh, bronze, it changes to a more brownish color. So the the material part up here is important to the aluminum. Uh, aluminum sixty sixty one. It might be that in twenty seventeen it's not added to the Yeah, so um, <clears throat> changing the material, it has to be done out in the out in the 3D part. You can't do it inside the sketch. Just to show that. And the material itself, when you're choosing the material, that is, if you're going to run later on when you're more advanced users, you can use simulations on your parts, and then it needs to know what is the material, what is the tensile yield, and uh, everything else, the yield strength. Uh, for, for that part, so it needs to know everything when it's going to run simulations on it. Other than that, if you have an aluminum plate, but it's going to be painted yellow, for example, be used somewhere where it's going to be painted, you can use the one beside the uh, materials, and here you only change the color. So you only, only change the, uh, the uh, color of the, uh, the surface, basically. Better? 
On my screen, also, it looks more more flat gray than uh, not the shining uh, stuff that's on, on here. So it's just lighting. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's right. Yeah, so, so you can, uh, I don't yeah. know yeah. if you're going to put it in. I can show you how to fix it. So it just right. It doesn't really matter. It's like waves. It's not a problem. Because if you want to change that, you can hover over it. You can see that it's this one. So you press the step down. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll finish off the part and start on the uh, 2D drawing. Uh, so what we do is we go up to the, the save symbol up there. We press it. People that haven't... Uh, or no one has done the 2D sketching, so what's smart now is save the ones you're doing and start making a 2D sketch with him now, because you haven't done that. So open your part one of task one. Yeah, basically, I'm going to save, save the part right now, and then I'm going to start making the 2D drawing of it. So, so, so the, yeah, the, none of the, you have done that, so you should just do it with him. So unless any of you have done it all on your own, then um, at least the, the student's assistant haven't helped anyone doing it, so everyone should uh, join me in on that. So that's the, that's the last part of each task, is to create a drawing for it. So since I've created a project for it already, you can see it's already choosing the correct folder for me. So it's already choosing practice task one, so I don't really need to do much, but it is sort of sort of uh, not really helpful to, to, to choose the default name, which is part and then a number. So it's often, uh, often wise to give it, uh, give it uh, an individual name. So in this case, I think I'm going to call it plate, just to, just to know what it is. In, in these first few practice tasks, where you're not going to assemble several parts together, it doesn't really matter. But later on, when you're going to create several parts and you're going to put them together into one, uh, one assembly, then it is very, very good to have separate names for each part, not just part one, part two, part three, because then it's a lot easier to have a name that is descriptive of that part. So in this case, we are creating a plate, so I'm calling it plate. Push the save button, and then it's done. And now, I'm going to leave this one open because I need to have it open before I start uh, creating uh, creating a uh, 2D drawing. But now I move my mouse pointer over to the over to the new part up there. So I press the new button up in the corner, and I get this new file folder up again. I'm still in the metric one because I chose that for the the part itself. So I'm still in the metric folder here. I'm not, I've already created the part file. And I don't have several parts, so I'm not going to create an assembly. But I'm going to create a drawing. But I'm not going to create a DWG drawing. I'm not sure if you have that in yours or if it's just 2015. I'm going to create a file that is named IDW, which is inventor drawing. And I want it to be an isometric one. So I want the iso.idw part. So this one, iso.idw. And you get a small preview of how such a file would look. So that's what we want it to be. And then I press the create button. So now I get an empty sheet up here. All I have is this title box in the corner. It's already pre-filled my initials here. Uh, depending on how you've uh, how you've uh, logged into your uh, or basically uh, depending on how you've uh, done things in your inventor, it will either do initials or your student number or whatever. Uh, when you're doing your submissions, you have to have your student number here because that's how I differentiate you from each other. So I I need to have the student number. But you will learn how to uh, how to manually fix this if if it doesn't put your student number automatically in there. <clears throat> so the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to create a base view, which is sort of, in this case, we want the base view to be like this. We want to look straight at the plate. Because looking at the plate like this won't really tell us much. 
So that won't be a base view. It, it can be a projected view, just to tell what, how thick the plate is. But it is this view that will give us the most dimensions. So this is what we will put in to begin with. So we go to the base view up here. And you can see that it uh, shows how we put it in. This will look a bit different on your screens. Um, I am uh, fairly confident. Uh, you, I think you already see a preview already uh, of the parts uh, in the middle there. Yeah. And that, that's uh, one of the differences from 2015 to 2017. So I'm going to have them fix this one uh, either today or tomorrow. Yeah. 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 I, I know it's completely different in 17. So it's, uh, it's not that uh, good for me to show it right now. But what I can do is if I move this one, so basically for me, it will show a preview exactly where my mouse cursor is. But for you, it shows the preview in the center of the sheet. So, so that's the difference here. Now, when I created this one in the 3D parts, I created it so that this view was from the top. So that the, the cube in the corner said top on mine. I think uh, for you, it actually shows the cube there. Yeah. So for me, I have to do it there instead of. So I need to find the, the top view. And there we see, that looks more like the plates that we want. I don't want it to be like this. So as I've placed it, I'm going to rotate it afterwards. But first, I have to place it. Oh, the cell the Yeah, yeah. So what, once you've managed to get your preview to look something like this, whether it looks, looks exactly like this or if it's rotated this way or some of the other ways, so long as you can see uh, the whole of your plate there, that's enough, and then you can place it. So when I when I do uh, when I rotate it and stuff, I have to use use these different options. But what you use is the small cube that's beside the preview. So you use this one to choose which way you are going to watch it. Right, so now I'm going to place this one, either by pressing the OK button in the window or just pressing directly on the sheet for my part. I'm not quite sure if you can press directly on the sheet. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll change the sizes uh, as we go along. So. So if you, if you need to change the scale or anything, you keep your mouse pointer on top of the, in this one so that you get the, the red, red box around it. Then you double click. 
because then you get this window back up. Your, your window, it looks a bit different, I know. But in that window, in that window, you have the scale options. So here you can change the scale if you want to. So then you just have to sort of try a couple of different scales and just see which one fits your sheet best. In this case, it's not a problem if it more or less fills the entire sheet because we, this is all that we are going to put in. We are just going to, to put a projected view here to give it a thickness afterwards. <coughs> so one to one is uh, fair enough. For my part, I don't want it to be up like this. That's, uh, it would be better for me to rotate it 90 degrees. So that's what I'm going to do with mine. So I use my right mouse button to open this one up. And then I go down to rotate down here. I press the rotate button. And what it says here is that uh, basically it's going to, I'm going to choose an edge on my part and it's going to be rotated until that edge is horizontal. And then these two tell if it's going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. So I'm going to do a clockwise and I want this edge to become horizontal. So I'm going to press it and then it just tilts it 90 degrees. Press OK and now it's, now I can uh, drag and drop it to a better location. If you're going to drag and drop it to move it around, you have to make sure that you have the red, uh, the red box around it because it's the red box that you're dragging and dropping. <coughs> so I'll just move it a bit over here. Now this, this view will allow us to put all of the dimensions on except one. The only thing that we can put on here is the thickness. Now there are several ways of doing this, is that you put all of the dimensions that you can on this one, and then you just write a note that the plate has a thickness of 10 millimeters. Or you can actually make a projected view on the side here, where you put the dimension on. So I'm going to do the projected view that one, projected view there. So I'm going to flip it over here. And then it's just create. So I have to do the right, right mouse button and then push the create in order to place it there. <clears throat> the reason why I do this projected one is when I put the dimension on top of this one here to give the thickness of the plate, if I, at a later date, figure out that 10 millimeters, that's, that's not enough on this plate. It needs to be 12 millimeters. So then I go into my 3D model and I change the thickness to 12 millimeters. Then this one will also be changed automatically. If I've just written in text here that the plate thickness is 10 millimeters, then I will have to go in and manually fix the text to 12 instead of 10. So if you actually do a projected view and put the dimension on there, it will be automatic. As soon as you fix the, the 3D model, the 2D uh, drawing will be updated. Or rather, the next time you open the 2D drawing, it will be updated. <coughs> yeah, uh, Binyam comes. Yeah, I'm going to show that before we uh, before we start for today, just so that you can uh, can work a bit uh, in your CAD study.
Yeah, because I think both are installed on the right computers. So you open this one, it's really 2015. So next time, if you just open 2017 instead, so then you will get, uh, then you will get because I'm going to get that one upgraded also. But, uh, it will all be in 2017. <laughs> so I thought they had been smart enough to do that. You will also want to do all the other courses, obviously. Um, so then we're going to the base view here. Uh, as you can see, when it just says front view, uh, so I'm going to show you here. This is front. So then you see it like that. This so that's what it says when you yeah. put front up here. You just see two on that side. If I do switch it around here, then you see the entire place. So then we go back to the base. And then we can pull up. Then we can set it up there. But uh, we will put it into scale 1 to 1 first. Then we sort of fill out the sheet, so it will be easier to read the dimensions out. So, he switched this to one to one. I'm putting this one out here. I'm just going to remove this one so we don't get confused. Now we need to rotate because it's. Press projected. It's not uh, optimal to have this way. Pull out to the side. The better to work. No, it's a bit more. Uh, we'll we'll just to click the first one. It, uh, and I should say this one. Uh, then yeah, I just click the uh, main make, make sure that I have this click. rectangle uh, around it. Mm -hmm. Click. Click. Right. Uh, and then I'll go down there and mm -hmm. rotate. Right. And then it says that I'm going to rotate uh, 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 by an edge. Uh, rotate the first one. The edge of the horizontal. And it's going to rotate the top one. So when I choose this edge, it's going to rotate it clockwise until it has this sort of one. So, just uh, a few more things before before I end the lecture, uh, just so that you can continue working a bit on your own in the CAD study. Uh, first off, as you can see here, this this line is the point here because it's been flipped like this. So. The plate here has been flipped like this, so we are looking at the point there. But you can see we have the, the dotted lines here, and those are these edges, because they are hidden by the rest of the plate. We don't want to show that, because that can be... Uh, it's not confusing on this uh, drawing, but uh, on more complex parts, it can be really confusing to have uh, hidden lines showing. So what I do is, I choose the base view again, I double click it to get this one up again. And here we have the style box. So the style box in here. And the one that's marked with me, it's marked as hidden line. That's not the one we want. We want the one that is marked, what's the name of it? Hidden line removed is the name actually. So we don't want it to show the hidden lines. There's also a possibility of making it shaded so that it will show it as the same same color as the 3D model does. So if you have it, if you have uh, have changed the color to red, uh, then it will show as red on the drawing also. 
uh, you don't use shaded on the part of the drawing where you're going to put your dimensions. But if you're going to put uh, uh, an isometric view so that you see it from an angle down in a corner just to show how the part looks like, then you can use shaded on that one just to uh, get a better view of it. In Imenko, when I worked there, uh, the, the standard was to not show it shaded if we, if we showed it as a 3D part in the corner. We did not shade it because what they had found out was that if you had it shaded and you ran it through a regular copy machine, uh, the shading part would be just, it would look horrible afterwards. So they stopped doing that with the shaded parts. I think new, new copy machines will have no problem doing that. But, but uh, this is something that stuck from, from uh, earlier years when the copy machines weren't all that good. So now we've, uh, uh, we are removing the hidden lines. We press OK. And now I'm going to show you how to, to start putting the dimensions out so that you can uh, start uh, doing that on your own in the CAD study. And in order to get to the dimensions, we need to move away from, from the view toolbar. So we need to move over to the annotate toolbar up here. Press this one, we get annotations. And that just basically means putting, uh, putting information onto the drawing. Uh, we are annotating it. For the most part on this one, we are only going to use general dimension and put that one out. So I'm going to choose it right now. Mark it there. And then we can start uh, giving some of our lines uh, dimensions. So for an example, we had 70 millimeters from this point to that point. Horizontally, we had 70 millimeters. So I'm choosing the point there, the green point, and then to the point there, and I'm moving the mouse to the bottom there. But before I place it now, you see that it says 70.00, or it actually uses comma, it doesn't use point even. So we don't want it to use, if it's just zeros behind, we don't want it to show those zeros. It's only if it's something else than zero. So what we're going to do, we're going to move the mouse up to format all the way up there. And instead of having by standard, we do the drop down menu. And we choose the default method 1B. This is something you actually have to do every time you're going to uh, start placing new dimensions. If you've uh, placed one dimension and chosen 1B, and then you continue placing dimensions, then 1B will, uh, will be uh, how the next dimensions will also be shown. But if you exit the dimension function and then enter it again, then you have to go back and fix that one. You can also fix it after you place the dimension, so you don't have to delete it and put it back. So I'm going to show that also. But now I'm going back here. I'm putting the 70 millimeters up here. And now it just says 70, it doesn't say 0 0.00. And you can also see it, it sort of made, makes it dotted when it puts it there. And that means that it's, it's sort of uh, auto-corrected the height. So it, if I put it on the dotted line here, I am also going to get the next one dotted when it gets here, so that we get a, a straight line going here. So I'm placing this one there. And now just to show, uh, if I, I have an exited dimension now, and it still says method 1B. So if I continue placing a dimension, it, it will also be method 1B, not a problem. But if I exit dimension now, I choose OK. I'm not in the dimension anymore, and I'm going to put another one in. Now it says by standard again, up there. Really annoying. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't notice it this time that it says uh, that it's set by standard. So I'm going to put the next dimension out here. And I didn't notice that it says 0, 0.00 either, so I put it out there. And then after I put it out there, then I notice it. Ah, crap. I have 0, 0 there. Everything you do then is just to you exit the dimension function. You mark the dimension so that it becomes green. And then you just go up and switch from by standard to method 1B. And then it's all, all good. 
So you don't have to delete the dimension and then put it in correctly again. So you can you can fix it afterwards. <coughs> so then you are free to continue putting on dimensions. We'll uh, look next week. We'll look into <coughs> filling out the title box and uh, doing the rest of the drawing. So we'll start off with this next week.